Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're dialing in from. Welcome to the 2021 Global Health Landscape Symposium, From Security to Solidarity. My name is Elisha Giorgio, and I'm the president and CEO of Global Health Council. I'm excited to be with you today, and I'm looking forward to a fruitful two days. As some of you may know, this is my first time attending the symposium as a GHC employee, having taken on the CEO role only a few months ago. Since joining GHC, I've been incredibly impressed at the staff and our amazing community of member organizations. I would be remiss if I didn't kick off this symposium with a huge thank you to the GHC team for all of your hard work putting this together and to all our members who contributed ideas, speakers, sponsorship, and helped us get the word out about this great program. We wouldn't be gathered here without all of those efforts, so thank you very much. So each year, the symposium provides an opportunity to join together to address some of the most pressing global health challenges, and this year is no different. This year's theme, From Security to Solidarity, is as timely of a topic as one can get. Nearly two years into the COVID-19 pandemic, the global health security narrative is more present than ever. Thankfully, calls for global solidarity are also getting louder, particularly as vaccine inequity between high income and low and middle income countries persist and new variants of the coronavirus continue to emerge. Unfortunately, these calls for solidarity have yet to result in the collective action we need from world leaders to right these inequities and bring us out of this pandemic. As COVID has shown us over and over, it does not care about borders. And yet at a time when a global response is required, we see countries turn to a nationalistic approach. Too many countries have focused response efforts solely within their borders or regions rather than sharing resources globally to achieve health security that is underpinned by health equity. Our discussion over the next two days is intended to get us thinking about the traditional view of global health security. If the global health security narrative is focused solely on national security, how do we account for the critical needs such as human rights, equity, dignity, and thriving development? And while the health security narrative has become more prominent over the years, there have been few opportunities to ask key questions about the unintended consequences of this type of health security language and whose needs are being prioritized. We know that health does not exist in a vacuum, that it is tied directly to economies, human rights, gender dynamics, and so much more. Throughout our time together, we will discuss how we can embed health equity within the definition of global health security and how linking human security and global health and development is a constructive approach. Since the pandemic began, I have heard, as I'm sure you all have too, over and over that we are at an inflection point. And so not to overuse an already overused phrase, but we are in fact at an inflection point. Through the leadership of the US, WHO, ACT A, and others, we have set ambitious global targets for achieving at least 70% of the population fully vaccinated by the UN General Assembly in September 2022. I don't need to tell this audience that we are woefully far from being on track to meet that goal. And while we are starting to see plans from USAID and others to turn vaccines into vaccinations in low and middle income countries, every day that we lag behind in an equitable global response, we not only risk further spread and frankly potential mutation of the virus, but we also risk further backtracking in essential health services and other global health gains. At Global Health Council, we take this very seriously, not only because we know that we need resilient health systems to tackle the pandemic and to achieve health equity, but because our failure to invest in health systems is in fact a failure to invest in people. For the person who can't access COVID vaccines, the man who can't get diabetes screening and treatment, the woman who can't get contraception or get her child vaccinated, 
And for the health worker who is underpaid and overworked, we need to do better. And we need to do better now. At GHC, we are ready to take on this charge and work with all of you to mobilize the resources and political will that is needed to achieve global health security and global health solidarity. I look forward to a very informative, engaging, and most importantly, actionable meeting. My hope is that over the next two days, we will make progress on determining how, together as a community, we can navigate our way out of the current pandemic, ensure we maintain progress against other diseases, and advance health equity so that achieving the global goals remains a possibility. Before we get into our first keynote, I want to once again say thank you to all for being here and for making GHC the strong entity it is. I'd also like to give a special acknowledgement to our symposium sponsors and program partners. Bear with me, this is a long list, but thank you to PATH, United Nations Foundation, Task Force for Global Health, 1000 Days, Pathfinder, Chemonix, Elizabeth Glazier Pediatric AIDS Foundation, MSH, Global Health Advocacy Incubator, Living Goods, Planned Parenthood Federation of America, PAI, and Core Group. We really appreciate your support. We wouldn't be able to do this without you. I also just have a couple of housekeeping notes that my team has asked me to lift up. So first, just a reminder that in plenary and concurrent sessions, we encourage you to pose questions, but audience members will have to use the chat function to pose questions for the moderator and the panelists. Second, we have closed captioning for all sessions, and you can find that feature next to the chat tab. Third, we will be restreaming keynote addresses and concurrent sessions during lunch. So if you weren't able to watch live, please tune in and, and see what you missed. And lastly, we have both a virtual exhibition booth space and a networking session scheduled. So you can find links to those in the program and we encourage all of you to visit the booth and participate in the networking. Okay, and now to get us started, I'm beyond pleased to introduce our opening keynote speaker who really needs no introduction, but I will do one anyway. Uh, we are privileged and honored to have Dr. Tedros, Director General of the World Health Organization here with us today. Dr. Tedros has served as WHO's Director General since 2017 and is the first person from an African country in the role. Previously, he served as Ethiopia's Minister of Health and then Minister of Foreign Affairs. I think as you all know, his leadership of WHO throughout the pandemic has been unflappable with consistent calls for global solidarity in the face of the pandemic. Dr. Tedros, thank you so much for taking time to be with us and setting the stage for this important Global Health Landscape Symposium. I'm pleased to welcome you and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Alicia. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, for the kind introduction, uh, dear colleagues and, and friends. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you today. Uh, yesterday marked one year since the first administration of a COVID-19 vaccine. We all believed and hoped at the time that a year later, we would be nearing the end of the pandemic. Instead, as we enter the third year of the pandemic, the death toll has more than tripled and the world remains in its grip. COVID-19 has now killed more than 5 million people and they're just the reported deaths. The excess, excess deaths caused by the virus and by disruption to essential health services are far higher. Health systems continue to be overwhelmed. Millions have missed out on essential life-saving health services for non-communicable diseases and mental health. Progress against HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, and many other diseases has stalled or gone backwards. Millions of children have missed out on vaccinations for other life-threatening diseases and months 
of education. Millions of people have lost their jobs or been plunged into poverty. The global economy is still clawing its way out of recession. Political divisions have deepened nationally and globally. Science has been undermined. Misinformation abounds. And inequalities have widened. And indeed, this is a pandemic of inequality. Because while nobody is safe, until everybody is safe, not everybody is equally at risk. Infections, hospitalizations, and deaths are grossly unequal between population groups within the same country. Around the world, the risk of death from COVID-19 is as much as four times higher for low-income and marginalized people as for wealthy people living in the same city. The pandemic has also exacerbated broader health inequities. Millions of people have been pushed deeper into poverty, particularly women, while massive disruptions to education have hurt poorer children the most. Inequities such as these put people at risk, not just for COVID-19, but for a range of health issues. Even before COVID-19, the world was off track for achieving the health-related targets in the SDGs. Now we are even further behind. Of course, the greatest inequity has been in access to vaccines. Since that first vaccination in the UK 12 months ago, more than 8 billion vaccines have been administered globally. The largest vaccination campaign in history. As we began to see some countries striking bilateral deals with manufacturers, we warned that the poorest and most vulnerable would be trampled in the global stampede for vaccines. And that's exactly what has happened. More than 40% of the world's population is now fully vaccinated. But in Africa, it's just 8%. At the beginning of June of this year, we issued a challenge to the world to support all countries to vaccinate 40% of the population by the end of this year and 70% by the middle of next year. But more than 100 countries still have not reached the 40% target. And more than half of them are at risk of missing it, mainly because they cannot access the vaccines they need. We understand and support every government's responsibility to protect its own people. But vaccine equity is not charity. It is in every country's best interests. We have often said that as long as vaccine inequity persists, the more opportunity the virus has to spread and mutate in ways no one can prevent or predict. And so we have Omicron, which threatens to unravel the gains we have made. South Africa and Botswana should be thanked for rapidly detecting, sequencing, and alerting the world to this new variant, not penalized for doing the right thing. Penalizing transparency is dangerous. It will discourage other countries from doing the same thing. Indeed, the emergence of Omicron demonstrates why the world needs a new system for bringing countries together to respond to pandemics. Our current system disincentivizes countries from alerting others to threats that will inevitably land on their shores. At its heart, 
The pandemic is a crisis of solidarity and sharing. The lack of sharing of information and data by many countries in the early days of the pandemic hindered our collective ability to get a clear picture of its profile and trajectory. The lack of sharing of biological samples hindered our collective ability to understand how the virus was evolving. The lack of sharing of PPE, tests, vaccines, technology, know-how, intellectual property, and other tools hindered our collective ability to prevent infections and save lives. And the lack of a consistent and coherent global approach has resulted in a splintered and disjointed response breeding misunderstanding, misinformation, and above all, mistrust, created a serious trust deficit. COVID-19 has exposed and exacerbated fundamental weaknesses in the global architecture for pandemic preparedness and response. Complex and fragmented governance, inadequate financing, and insufficient systems and tools. Voluntary mechanisms have not solved these challenges. The best way we can address them is with a legally binding agreement between nations, an accord forged from the recognition that we have no future but a common future. Global health security is too important to be left to chance or goodwill or shifting geopolitical currents or the vested interests of companies and shareholders. As you know, at a special session of the World Health Assembly last week, WHO's 194 member states decided to negotiate a convention, agreement or other international instrument on pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. A new accord will not solve every problem, but it will provide the overarching framework to foster greater international cooperation in four key ways. First, better governance. The governance of global health security is complex fragmented and has failed to ensure effective collective action and equitable access to vaccines and other tools. High-level threats need high-level political engagement, which is why WHO supports the idea of a heads of state council anchored in WHO to provide high-level political leadership for rapid and coordinated action. Second, better financing. Cycles of panic and neglect have created an unstable and unpredictable financing ecosystem for global health security. Strengthening the world's defenses demands financing that's truly additional, predictable, equitable, and aligned with national, regional, and global priorities. A mechanism funded solely from voluntary development assistance will only increase competition for already scarce resources. And we have seen this again and again. WHO supports the idea of a financial intermediary fund supported by a secretariat based at WHO, housed at the World Bank and financed by countries and regional organizations on a burden-sharing basis. Third, we need better systems and tools to predict, prevent, detect, and respond rapidly to outbreaks with epidemic and pandemic potential. In September, we opened the WHO Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence in Berlin, a new center designed to enhance global surveillance by harnessing the power of collaborative and artificial intelligence and other cutting 
edge technologies. Collaborative intelligence is the way and can build trust. Other initiatives are in development, including the WHO Biohub system to provide a reliable, safe, predictable, and transparent mechanism for countries to share novel biological materials. More than 12 countries have already volunteered. Several countries are now piloting the universal health and preparedness review, a peer review mechanism for enhancing national preparedness modeled on the universal periodic review used by the United Nations Human Rights Council. And fourth, the world needs a strengthened, empowered, and sustainably financed, financed WHO at the center of the global health architecture. With 194 member states and 152 country offices, WHO has unique expertise, a unique global mandate, unique global reach, and unique global legitimacy. But over several decades, WHO has been weakened by a debilitating imbalance between assessed and voluntary earmarked contributions that distorts our budget and constrains our ability to deliver and affects our independence. One of the greatest risks to global health security now is to further weaken WHO or to further fragment the global health architecture. The COVID-19 pandemic demonstrates that when health is at risk, everything is at risk. The economy, jobs, trade, social cohesion, political stability, and multilateralism. That's why health cannot be seen as a luxury, but as a human right, not as a cost, but an investment, not simply as an outcome of development, but as a fundament, as a foundation of social, economic, and political stability and security. Health as a fundamental human right, an end in itself, plus a means to development. That's why investing in health is the smartest thing to do by any nation. And that's why WHO's top priority remains supporting all countries to strengthen primary health care as the foundation of universal health coverage. Resilient health systems that provide access to the services people need where and when they need them without facing financial hardship are the bedrock of global health security. But we must recognize that a resilient health system is not the same thing as an advanced medical care system. For too long, too many countries have invested heavily in advanced medical care while under-investing in public health and primary health care. When COVID-19 hit, they were overwhelmed. Even the wealthiest countries were surprised. At the foundation of universal health coverage, Primary health care is a vital first line of defense against disease outbreaks, but also for providing services for communicable and non-communicable diseases, including mental health, and for preventing and mitigating the impacts of social, economic, and environmental determinants of health, including climate change. Ultimately, this pandemic will end, but we will still be left with many of the same challenges we had before. There is no vaccine for poverty, climate change, racism, 
inequality and many of the other shared threats we face. In the coming months and years, other crises will demand our attention and distract us from the urgency of taking action now. Now is the time for all countries to make the choice to invest in a healthier, safer, and fairer future. I thank you. And Madam President, back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tedros. We greatly appreciate the time given how busy your life is and hearing all of those words makes us even more grateful for you to be here. I, there's so many good quotes in there that I'm sure everyone attending this conference agrees on. So thank you very much. We won't keep you any longer. We know you have world problems to solve and again, grateful for you to be here. Thank you, Alicia. Very honored to join you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Wow, that was a great speech. Um, so many things in there to say, but I think, you know, at the time we're in, vaccines, uh, equity is not charity. Um, it's, I think we've heard that many times over and, and it's true. Uh, so I'm gonna turn now to our first plenary and um, welcome these folks up to the, the virtual stage as it were. Um, our first conversation is around redefining global health security, and it is moderated by Carolyn Reynolds from the Pandemic Action Network. Hi, Carolyn. Welcome. Hi, Alicia. Great to Hi. see you. Great to be with everyone. Thank you for doing this. And I am going to exit the stage and we will bring up our panelists and yeah. hand it over to you. Great. Look forward to um, seeing everyone join me. Let's just pause for a moment. We have, as they come on screen, we're onto the virtual stage. And one more, there we go. Great, we have everyone. So welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And in fact, this panel truly is spanning the globe today. Um, I'm Carolyn Reynolds. I'm a co-founder of the Pandemic Action Network. Um, I'm here in Washington, D.C., and I'll be your moderator. Um, for those, many of our Pandemic Action Network partners I know are joining us from around the world today. But for those of you who don't know who we are, we're a network of more than 150 organizations around the world, all working to drive collective action to end this pandemic and prevent the next one. Um, I also have the privilege to co-chair the Global Health Council uh, Global Health Security Roundtable with my colleague and friend uh, Ashley Arbasati from MSH. So I'm coming here today in this conversation wearing both of those hats. Um, just a quick housekeeping moment, just again that um, uh, if you're just joining us, uh, closed captioning is available on the right hand side of your screen and just to click on the CC um, icon. And um, so uh, look, Dr. Tedros, that was a really sobering um, uh, message. Um, to kick us off, um, but but appropriately so. Um, and I really want to commend our friends at the Global Health Council for the whole topic of this symposium uh, from security to solidarity, but also kicking it off with this panel on redefining global health security. Um, it couldn't be more timely for all the many reasons that Dr. Tedros just laid out in his comments. Um, I just want to go back maybe and uh, to a couple of things he said um, to set the stage, but also maybe with a slightly different spin uh, in, the, uh, in the voice of an advocate. Um, we are about to enter year three of this pandemic. Year three. Just think about that for a moment. Think about where you were two years ago at this time. Getting ready for the holidays, going to lots of parties seeing all your friends, planning trips, making New Year's resolutions. Think about where you were one year ago at this time. Um, we were all a little beleaguered. We all had been impacted by the pandemic one way or another, and many of us much worse than others. But we were also hopeful, as Dr. Tedros talked about one year ago, the first vaccines were being administered, had just been approved, and were starting to be administered to health workers. And we saw, we thought we saw the end of the pandemic in sight. 
And now think about where we are today. I won't go through the litany of statistics. He did that very well and we know them, but we know the numbers are going up, not down. And we, the, the coming weeks could be, could be um, another surge. We know there are the huge global inequities in vaccination. Dr. Tedros spoke to those numbers that are still striking. And Delta is still raging. And now we have this scary new variant in Omicron that we're still learning about. We don't know exactly how dangerous it will be. The data is coming out. It's very mixed. Maybe it won't be so bad, but we know it's highly infectious. And if, God forbid, we the vaccines we have now prove not to be that effective, or we're gonna require many more boosters to make them effective, um, we're gonna enter a new global arms race on vaccination. So this inequity gap that we face now is not gonna close, it's gonna widen. So in short, not to be a downer at the beginning of the day uh, or the end of the day as it speaks, but this is a sobering moment. The pandemic is far from over and we still don't really truly have a global plan of action to get it done. We have targets, that's really good, but we don't really have a concerted, committed plan of action by policymakers. Um, just yesterday, our friends at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, Johns Hopkins and the Economist Intelligence Unit released the second Global Health Security Index, um, underscoring that the world is dangerously unprepared, I quote, for the next pandemic, which could come at any time. And that index echoed the warnings from earlier this year from the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, from the G20 High Level Panel on Financing, from the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, from our Pandemic Action Network, and so many more. Um, and yet, you know, Dr. Tedros said we may see uh, attention turning to other things. We already see it. We already see growing complacency by world leaders that this is kind of what we're going to have to live with. We see that setting in, we see leaders turning to other priorities, whether it's climate or um, democratization or cybersecurity, well, they're all really important issues, right? But we're not treating this current pandemic as the global crisis that it is. I would argue in a way we never have um, and wanting to look past it. It's human nature, right? We wanna, we wanna look to a better day, we all do, but we're never gonna get past this unless we truly treat it as a global crisis and as a global solution. Um, and we haven't been able to do that even when we've lost so many lives, so many livelihoods have been impacted. Literally everyone in the world has been impacted by this. Even when we've set, it's already set back so much progress on global health and education and poverty reduction and gender equality, all the things that Dr. Chavez talked about and continuing. And here in the U.S., we just failed to get our own Congress to pass what was arguably a fairly modest but important signal bill to that would have moved uh, the ball forward on some of those steps on both response and preparedness. So that's just one example of where we're seeing failing to see policymakers treat this with the urgency it deserves. And, you know, financing gaps to solve this crisis, which are in the billions. Yeah, that's a lot of money, but the trillions and counting that this and uh, the impact of this crisis has had. So where, where is the sense of political will and the sense of urgency to end this crisis? When we have a strong investment case, this crisis is solvable, experts are aligned on what we need to do in the urgency, yet there's a repeated failure to act and invest. So if we can't mobilize action commensurate with the threat now, then when? But I, so to this panel, the reason this panel is so important, at the core of this problem is that even before COVID, global health security didn't really have a strong constituency not a really good understanding of what it is and what it isn't. Um, even today when COVID is everyone's business, I would argue that global health security and pandemic preparedness, which is my preferred term, and I can talk more about that why, um, it still, still is not as strong as it should be. It means different things to different people, global health security. It evokes reactions from some that it's a shift away from health equity or solidarity towards national security. There's perceptions that it's not values-based, that it's grounded in self-interest. There's fears that attention on global health security is a zero-sum game for other global health priorities. Um, and others are concerned that it's directly at odds with, the, you know, with that, that kind of fundamental notion that we're, um, that we're all in this together. I reject that. I reject that as a false choice. And I believe we can't have global health security without solidarity and equity and vice versa. So, because it, it's also, 
it's not just a matter of global health. It's a matter of our economy, of our security, of frankly, our society and, and the human condition. So, but we can't forge consensus and solutions unless we all agree at least on what we're trying to solve and if we're speaking past each other. So the language we use matters. And at the end of the day, that language has to resonate with the people who have to make the decisions to change this. Um, and for the audiences, we're trying to reach both publics and ultimately their policymakers to spur action. So we have a terrific panel to dig into this. Um, let me briefly introduce them. First, my good friend, Beth Cameron, special assistant to the president, senior director for the Global Health Security and Biodefense at the National Security Council at the White House. Um, and uh, Beth, many of you know, she was also previously VP for Global Biological Policy and Programs at the Nuclear Threat Initiative and many other things uh, based here in Washington, DC, where I am. Welcome, Beth. We have um, Justin Coonan, who's president of the AIDS Council of New South Wales, or ACON, and also co-chair of the UHC 2030 Steering Committee, um, along again with many other roles. I'm just gonna highlight these, uh, their extensive bios. He's also, interestingly, an investment analyst, an analyst and a mathematician by training. So uh, that's a different angle to bring into this. Welcome, Justin, based in Sydney, and it's very late for you, so thank you for uh, joining us late in your evening. Um, Satoshi Izo is the director of global health, the Global Health Policy Division at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for Japan. He previously was in charge of global health uh, as a counselor to the permanent, uh, the permanent mission of Japan to the United Nations in New York, and also joining us very late from Tokyo. Thank you so much, Satoshi. And last but not least, we have Andrea Weiner. Andrea is the Executive Vice President for Rapid and Molecular Diagnostics for Abbott. Um, she served in a variety of roles since joining the company in 1997, cross diagnostics, but also pharmaceuticals, animal health, and really brings a terrific range of expertise to this conversation. So let's get started. Um, I wanna first ask each of our panelists to respond to this question and just take a couple minutes each. What does global health security, and if you wish, global health security and solidarity, what does that mean to you? And Beth, I'm gonna start with you. Great. Well, first, um, thanks so much, Carolyn, and thanks to the Global Health Council, and thanks to Dr. Tedros for kicking us off so well this morning. Um, this is a critical topic. It's uh, personal to me. It's really important to the administration um, here in Washington, and it's so good to see so many really close friends on this panel. Um, good morning, good evening um, to all of you. Um, so health security is really uh, one of the issues at the top of the list for the Biden administration, and we focused on this alongside the COVID-19 response from the first day in office. And we've focused on improving it in conjunction with multilateral partners. And I think that's critically important that health security, one of the, the hallmarks of health security is that it's multilateral at its core. And I just wanna say that up front. So to me, health security really means closing the preparedness gap by building and sustaining capacities everywhere for everyone to prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease threats. And that's any kind of disease threat, whether it's naturally occurring, whether it's accidental, whether it's deliberate, any infectious disease threat. It means facing a pandemic like this one and knowing, uh, knowing that it won't cost millions of lives and major setbacks in global health and, and, and trillions in economic loss. It means beating COVID-19, but simultaneously, because the next health emergency can and will, we know, arrive at any time, um, it means simultaneously preparing for and working to prevent the next biological catastrophe. Health security is a measurable subset of the broader health system, um, and it really begins at the country and the local level. Um, the global health security agenda, which many of us were involved in and have remained um, involved in, has made great strides in launching peer evaluations of these specific capacities that are measurable and the World Health Organization has taken them on board in their joint external evaluation. And this was really a huge step forward to identify actual measurable capacities within the health system that are specific to health emergencies and the core capacities of the international health regulations. But I think it's also critically important to note that health security is only achievable in the context of a strong health system. That includes community health, it includes access to care. And that's why it's so important to include and look at measures of, of these, um, of the broader health system when we're looking at health security so that we can really understand how prepared a whole country system is to deal with an emerging epidemic threat and pandemic. 
This includes healthcare workers. This includes universal health coverage. It's also vital, I think, to improve regional capacity and availability of global commons and global public goods. Um, for example, the African Union has launched several successful platforms during this pandemic, and I think we can all learn a great deal from those regional platforms, including AVAT, notably for vaccine access and delivery. And delivery. We've learned that preparedness relies on the availability of personal protective equipment and medical countermeasures in regions um, and coordinated across countries. And we didn't have those systems in place outside of the work that was specifically done for influenza under the PIP framework many years ago. So health security really needs to include those capacities to produce, to distribute, to administer vaccines, treatments, and tests. And those need to build on existing systems and leverage those, including those funded and implemented through global health security programs, um, through PEPFAR, through the Global Fund, through Gavi, and through UNICEF. Um, as you said, I think that it is a false choice. We have to be looking at these capacities in the context of all of the other investments that we have, and we need the institutions to create and deliver uh, these these goods um, within a short period of time. Um, last, uh, but certainly not least, and I know close to your heart, uh, Carolyn, and work that the Global Health Council and others have done, we need financing for these efforts, and we need in incentives for countries to sustainably invest in them. Um, that's why President Biden and Vice President Harris have been involved in and have called for the establishment of a financial intermediary fund at the World Bank, which is supported by the WHO as well, in keeping with the recommendation of the G20 high-level independent panel. And this can't wait. Um, the United States has some funding for this effort, um, and we've requested more. We have $250 million. We've requested $850 million more from Congress. Um, but we're calling on countries, the private sector, and philanthropies to really join us in creating and financing this endeavor. And then just the last thing I'll say is health security capacity needs to be utilized and exercised. Having the capacity is one thing. And when you look at tools like the index, you see some countries, including the United States, um, which have a lot of capacity, but have not always effectively used it early on in this pandemic. And I think that that has been true for many countries around the world. And it's something we really need to build on together um, as a community. Thanks. Thanks so much, Beth. A lot to dig in there. And we'll come back to some of the really important points you made. Um, I want to turn to Justin. Let's go travel across to Sydney on the other side of the world. And um, Justin, what's your take? What does global health security solidarity mean to you? Hello, Carolyn. Hello, everyone. And thank you to GHC. It's terrific to be here. I think those two concepts, global health security and global health solidarity, are not necessarily the same thing. They can be strongly aligned, but they can also lead to very different conclusions and outcomes. At its best, global health security does engender solidarity in, among nations. But as we've also seen over the years, focusing exclusively on a health security narrative in the sense of national security can lead to victimization of minorities, to othering, to the treatment of people from different countries, particularly those of the global south as vectors of disease rather than as fellow humans in pursuit of a sustainable future, to the militarization of public health. And all of those things are the very opposite of global solidarity. So I think we need to look back on the ways in which global well, the, the global health security narrative has been used over the past several de decades to determine what in it has been useful. And there are many things that have been useful uh, and what has not. And then ask ourselves not so much what has global health security meant in the past, but what do we want it to mean as we move forwards? And for me, that means incorporating the narrow context in which health security has traditionally been used, that is infectious disease, pandemic preparedness, but then going beyond it to something much more inclusive, uh, and our first speaker alluded to this already, uh, but something that recognizes that you simply can't have global health security unless you also address health systems more broadly, unless you make progress on universal health coverage, unless you address leadership and governance and social determinants of health, and unless you treat people in other countries as partners and not as threats, COVID-19 has taught us nothing if we're not if not that we are completely inter interdependent. So that's what true global health security looks like to me. And if we move in that direction, I think it starts to look a lot more like global health solidarity as well. Thanks. Thanks, Justin. So I'm picking up some really important terms, right, that we want to come back to from Beth, measurable. <laughs> 
so I'm putting some very concrete things stands up to me, but you made a very important point of interdependence. So mm -hmm. just a couple of things to, to start people thinking. Uh, Satoshi, let's travel up to Tokyo from Sydney and uh, global health security. Uh, what does it mean to you? Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Caroline and the Global Health Council for inviting me for, for the, to this very important panel. So, um, well, global health security and solidarity. Uh, well, for me, that means everyone everywhere has mm -hmm. access to quality and affordable health services that is resilient to any health threats. This is kind of like a s simplified version of, uh, you know, uh, conventional mm -hmm. definitions of those. But I think that the core of this notion is universal health coverage. And as, as some of you might know, Japan has been a, a sort of like a, a keen advocate of this uh, concept even before COVID-19. And I myself was deeply involved in the negotiation for the universal health coverage high level meeting a political declaration, which is for me, uh, you know, landmark uh, agreement just before COVID-19. And so uh, with this notion in mind, Japan, J the Japanese government has been tackling COVID-19 uh, uh, with this in mind, a universal health coverage uh, to secure um, uh, essential health services for all, not, not just immediate threats. So um, with this, uh, the, the government, our administration uh, has been tackling COVID-19 with, uh, with three um, you know, major points. Uh, one is to uh, address uh, immediate uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, well, obviously, that is the most, you know, uh, uh, present, clear and present danger right now for the world. So, so that is the, the, the first and foremost. We need to tackle the pandemic with uh, equitable access to uh, vaccines, uh, diagnostics and treatments. But also the, the second point is to have a slightly longer view to, to, um, to, to prepare already for the next pandemic and, and other threats by strengthening health systems. And, and the third one is to also uh, have a you know, broader uh, global health security environment, uh, including through uh, securing water and sanitation or nutrition or gender or, or even education. So, these three pillars are sort of like uh, our uh, concept in tackling COVID-19. And um, I will basically end here for now, but I just wanted to pick up uh, one, one very important uh, term that Alicia mentioned in her first um, opening, which is human security. So um, this is another very important concept that Japan has been uh, promoting. Uh, which is uh, protecting the vital core of, of human lives in ways that enhance human freedom and fulfillment. So when we discuss national security or even global security, uh, at least you know, Japan is also uh, interested in uh, promoting human security. So I would like to just uh, highlight that as well. And uh, I'll stop here and looking forward to further discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Satoshi. And Japan has truly been a leader on both the issue of universal health coverage, but this concept of human security for um, more, I think, two decades or more now. Um, and uh, so it's interesting. Here we are arrived at this moment having this discussion, but you really were a leader in defining that space. Let me turn to Andrea. Uh, and Andrea, um, global health security, global health solidarity, what does it mean to you? Well, thank you, Carolyn, and the Global Health Council for having me join this really important conversation. And maybe I'll build upon uh, the definitions that have already been shared, which have been said so eloquently. And as long as we have infectious diseases crossing borders, we have to attack them in, in as one. And so what I thought I would do is bring to the conversation, you know, the pandemic preparedness. You talked about that definition, right? And from a diagnostics perspective, this is where we can really um, add to the conversation because we are the eyes to be first to identify these emerging threats. And at Abbott, we have brought in and, and expanded our Abbott uh, Pandemic Defense Coalition, which is a, a network of uh, public health labs and our surveillance program. So we can very early on identify infectious disease emerging threats. We've done this with HIV and hepatitis for decades, and we've expanded this to respiratory illness, which is proving to be so important. 
um, because we need a network, a, a solidarity, a network of labs across the globe in which we can very early identify pathogens, emerging threats, um, look at them and analyze them across hundreds of thousands of sequences to determine, do we have a threat? Um, and in terms of COVID specifically, it's about determining, do we have a variant? And then how do we operate uh, holistically in a network across the globe to say, yes, we've identified something, and how do we act on that extremely quickly to prevent uh, the next big one and to also manage them when the outbreaks do cross borders? So again, and it's not only about surveillance, but also it's about where we are today, where the, where the pandemic has spread. It's about continuing to understand um, using the resources that we have to determine um, who has been infected, who is infected, and who potentially has some protective immunity so that we can really collectively determine how best to use our resources. So maybe that's just broadening a definition in regards when we say pandemic uh, preparedness in, in the diagnostic industry, you know, we play an extremely important role. Um, and it is uh, because our viruses are, you know, they, they don't know borders. Uh, we have to look at this as a global health community. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andrea. And again, it's interesting, you're already seeing some of the, the both divisions, but also hopefully some of the places to bridge the divide. You know, I, I, I know you use the word pandemic defense. So you are bringing that notion of security into the definition, but at the same time, a solidarity of, net, of, uh, of laboratories, a solidarity of capacities around the world. And so again, to this point that, um, you know, it, language matters, but we also need to find ways to bridge this language that speaks to different audiences, but that ultimately gets everyone behind the same cause. So, so let's, let's take this conversation to the next level. You've all laid out some areas of, of priority that you see from your respective vantage points from government, from uh, civil society, from the private sector. Um, this is a big topic. It's so big. And that's sometimes whether we're talking, you know, and, and we've defined it as there is a specific set of things, Beth, you started off with that, that actually are measurable and definable when it comes to capacities to detect, prevent, and respond to um, outbreaks, uh, to stop pandemics, essentially, to, from happening. We won't stop outbreaks, but we can stop pandemics. Um, but then it is, but you then, but it's rooted in resilient health systems and you've all spoken to pieces of that. So where does it stop? Where do we, where do we put, where do we draw those lines? Because if it's everything, then it's nothing. And as an advocate, how do you move an agenda, right? We all want at the end of the day, a healthier, safer world, but there are there, we want to, uh, end HIV AIDS, we want to end uh, malaria and tuberculosis, we want to stop the next pandemic, we want to make sure every uh, mother and child, uh, you know, uh, every child is, is able to survive and thrive and that every mother is able to, you know, um, have a, you know, choose when she wants to have a, a child and have a safe, uh, you know, safe delivery, all of these things, these are all important. Um, but where, where, how do we we have to put some some parameters on this. So, where for you are those parameters? Where are those priorities? What, what are the what are the things we have to do most urgently? Maybe as a different way to frame it. Um, and what are what do you see as the challenges and opportunities to get there? So, Beth, let me come back to you. Yeah, Carolyn, that's a lot to dig into as well. Um, but it's, <laughs> it's a really important question because I think what we you know what I heard was a lot um, a lot of commonality, but also. A real question here, um, how, how are we using this term? What does it mean? What does it not mean? And I do think that at, at its core, global health security was originally defined as the set of capabilities that are within a health, rooted within a health system. And I think that discussion and that piece of the definition is sometimes not emphasized enough. And I agree 100% that it needs to be emphasized more. Um, but that those capacities that are especially important in the face of an emerging outbreak that could become a health emergency, an epidemic or a pandemic that crosses borders. And I think that that also gets to the root of some of the challenges that I think Justin outlined in the way that this term is sometimes used or interpreted. And I think those are really important, meaning at the 
fundamentally, sometimes this language is used to mean how do I protect national health security in the face of an emerging outbreak anywhere in the world that may come from outside of my borders. And I, I think one of the most important things that we can really do as we are looking at the health and health security architecture for the future in order to provide human security in the face of a health challenge um, is we can we need to look at these things together. So I think that we do need more conversations that bring together um, all of the institutions that we have for improving global health and looking um, importantly at what we still need that are, that is more particular to an outbreak that can that can rapidly spread and, and turn into a catastrophe. And so by that I mean bringing together um, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, Gavi, the Global Fund. Um, when we have a new financial intermediary fund for health security and determining what are the capacities that we need, what are the insti which institutions are going to build them, what capabilities do we need on a country level, what capabilities do we need on a regional level. And these conversations I think you all know are happening and we're having them in government. I know you're having them outside of government and in the private sector as well. But I do think that there's a more dedicated conversation to be had that is more specific about the measurable capacities that we need to build the health system that we need for all health related threats, including access to care, including um, uh, including um, our ability to prevent, detect, um, importantly, you raised the detection issue, Andrea, and respond to disease threats. So I think a little bit more um, actual overlap in those conversations is important. Mm -hmm. And I also think recognition um, that when we're talking about health security, um, it is important to recognize that national security and leaders at the top of the of the of the chain in terms of governance, they're very important to this conversation. And they they do rightly care about national health security. But I think we all just need to recognize that national health security and global health security are inter, inter, interlinked, and we need to make those linkages more um, more available to our leaders in our conversations um, that we're having about global health and global health security. And the last thing I'll say is here at the National Security Council staff, my colleague Linda Edam, who many of you know, and me and our teams are having a number of conversations about how to bridge these gaps. This is a really timely conversation, and we look forward to hearing more from outside and inside government um, about how we can do that more effectively. Thanks, Beth. Um, you know, uh, it's we the the we yeah we have to find a way to bridge this. You talk about the the overlap, but we um, we are. I still I still think that there is we are there, we tend to talk past each other and see this as this somehow this zero sum game of it's one or the other. And if we if we emerge from this pandemic. And we have invest, I, I'm concerned we will fall back overall in investments in health, let alone not do the additional funding we need, we know the investments we know that are needed for this chronic underinvestment and actually those very public health capacities that Dr. Tedros and you talked and others talked about that are needed to detect, prevent, and respond. Uh, but then we also know that the global health challenges that the, the existing institutions and we've all, you know, been involved in helping to support. We're we've you know we've reversed progress on those. So we have to do more in our existing efforts around global health, and we have to invest more in specific capacities related to pandemic preparedness. And surely we can do that. Um, but we have to have this mindset. We have to change that mindset. Justin, um, and, and I will also want to say to our audience, our chat is already um, becoming quite lively. Keep it coming and we'll work in some of these questions and comments as we go. Um, but um, actually, maybe I'll feed one in, in to you, uh, Justin. Uh, you know, so what for you are the priorities um, and the challenges when you think about global health security that you want to see? Um, we have, we have um, audience members who are saying, how can we use existing primary care systems, such as maternal and child health programs, for example, as an anchor for global health security? So maybe you can dig into that a little bit more, what you see as the priorities and challenges there. Thanks. Let, let me start by responding to that question very briefly. I know we'll have more time for conversation later but I completely think we need to build on the systems we have. We, we have many, many systems and programs and partnerships and uh, 
you know, just, just as we saw that these existing partnerships leverage to create the Access to Cover Tools Accelerator, and we can debate the, the success or otherwise of that, um, we, we need to use the expertise of what we've got. And it's just certainly not about reinventing the wheel uh, and much more to say about that. Uh, but I do want to talk about uh, some of the opportunities, some of the priorities, as you also, also questioned. Uh, and I'll start with the opportunities because I think the injection of global health security as an idea into the global health landscape, particularly over the past couple of decades, has really focused attention on the importance of health as a key component of human development. Uh, and of course, COVID-19 has exacerbated that tremendously. As we all know, governments have a multitude of priorities. And if we want them to prioritize health, we need them to pay attention. Well, there's nothing like a global pandemic which brings countries to their knees to do that. So I think we need to ride that energy. And in my earlier response, I focused on some of the negative connotations of glo around global health security. But it's really important that we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. What we need to do is to come to a common understanding of global health security, which will keep the attention of governments, but is, which is also inclusive enough to drive this real structural change in health systems, systems, which we know is so important. And so that leads naturally to the question of priorities. On the one hand, global health security cannot include just the narrow infectious disease preparedness agenda that it sometimes has in the past. And on the other hand, it can't be everything. The recent Global Health Council paper on this topic makes this point very well, because that just leads to health security fatigue and difficulty deciding what's important. So for me and for UHC and, uh, and for UHC 2030, the twin goals are UHC and health security. We cannot wait until we've fixed health security before we address UHC later. There can't be true health security without UHC and it's short-sighted to think that we can. How we get there, the means is health system strengthening and the approach, what we do is through prioritizing primary health care. A focus on primary health care gives us the best chance to reach as many people as possible, as efficiently as possible. UHC 2030 has actually just released a paper on this approach uh, called Action on Health Systems for Universal Health Coverage and Health Security, which you can find on our website. And I see that Eliana has also posted it into the chat box. There are several key challenges. I know, Carolyn, you asked about challenges as well, particularly around how we develop health systems which are equitable and how we create health systems which are resilient. On equity, the fundamental commitment made in the SDGs is to leave no one behind, to put the most marginalized first. But as we know, there are multiple systemic reasons why health systems do not develop equity. Uh, and these are often rooted in wider social and economic determinants gender, ethnicity, race, socioeconomic status, and so on. And addressing those is a real challenge, but critical to global health solidarity. On resilience, it's about breaking the constant cycle of panic and neglect. It's not the same thing as focusing on advanced healthcare, as Hedra said, and there's much more to say on this topic, uh, as well as on the question of, of building on existing partnerships, but perhaps we can pick those up in conversation. Over to you, Carol. Thanks, Justin. Satoshi, wanna, I want to bring you in here. Um, how do you see it? Where, where do we, where do we, where are the priorities? Where do we prioritize investments for global health security, but also, as you say, with that view towards human security and resilient health systems? What are the challenge? Where, where are those priorities? What are those challenges and opportunities you see? Yes. So, um, well, I think the opportunity on global health security or even the, the COVID-19 pandemic itself is that the, the health uh, you know, area has gotten uh, higher level attention, political level and heads of state level attention. That, that is actually an opportunity. And so, because uh, you know, before COVID-19, we were struggling to even have more attention to those, uh, you know, health system strengthening agenda or universal health coverage agenda. Although we we managed to have that political political declaration, mm -hmm. uh, we were struggling to have uh, attention at the highest level. But uh, you know, uh, all the heads of states and governments are, you know have now have to do something about uh, the the covid-19 so so they so this is a, an opportunity but the uh, the the challenge is that uh challenge is not to create 
you know, uh, even more more complexity into already crowded uh, global health arena. And so the challenge is how to use this uh, momentum and more attention uh, to health security, global health security, in the, in a way that you know uh, um, address other health issues like maternal and child health, or you know, uh, um, women and 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 sexual and productive you know uh, health and rights and other other health agendas and you know for me uh, uh you know the i think the common common um well the 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 common uh idea that we need to uh sort of stress is that not to stress you know one you know single health agenda too much but but try to be as holistic as possible so universal health coverage is is very uh, you know holistic like so so, so I, I i consider that as an big umbrella for for all the health agendas whereas the health system is kind of like a cornerstone uh, as a basis for for those different agendas health agendas so and in terms of the global health security um i think uh the uh, the the challenge is to how to broaden the the scope of its uh, you know uh, because in a narrower sense as Beth mentioned it, it is about the, you know how to strengthen the surveillance systems or how to s s strengthen the lab systems that uh, has been uh, tackled by global health security agenda for example and that is good and that is very important but we need to try to broaden the scope so that it can really cover other health agendas in line with universal health coverage and health systems um and uh, just to uh, add one one more sort of realistic uh point so uh for me uh, personally i i would uh, like to promote uh universal health coverage or health system strengthening as an agenda even within the government and but uh the the reality is that uh, we need to secure, uh, for example, vaccination, you know, vaccine rate uh, uh, first before even talking about more, uh, you know, holistic, um, broader issues like human, uh, uh, um, uh, human, you know, workforce, human workforce or uh, other areas. So uh, we need to tackle, uh, I think, for example, vaccination issues first and then to tackle other issues. Uh, so, for example, there will be a COVAX uh, replenishment sometime next year, early next year. Um, and there will be, uh, and the target is to secure 70% of all the, the population in the world, as, uh, as Dr. Tedros mentioned. Uh, so we need to tackle that in, in a realistic world. And then, uh, and then, and we, we can continue to, to address other issues. Um, so I'll stop here and, and uh, yeah. Well, Hope Satoshi, I'm sure that you've sparked our, some um, comments and questions from our audience because uh, I mean, I, what I, you, you said some really uh, critical things about we have to broaden, um, we have to broaden the definition of global health security to lift all boats, but yet, you know, we're also hearing we have to put some definitions on it in order to drive agenda. And then you just alluded to one prioritization. Let's focus on vaccination and then on, on other things. You know, a lot of people feel like, why can't we do all of this at the same time? But it's the, there are political and financial realities, although we also know that there's plenty of money to go around. Right. It's an issue of political will. Um, Andrea, uh, from where you sit in industry, do we you know, what are those? where do we prioritize our efforts? Obviously you have a specific, you know, uh, area of business, but, um, you know, surveillance diagnostics, but um, talk more about what, what else you see as critical. Oh, we're not hearing you. There we go. You're on mute. Second. There you go. We got you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties. Well, um, right now, you know, we're we're in the middle of a surge. The surges continue. So, in terms of the urgent challenges in front of us from an industry perspective, it's like we have to operationalize, right? You know, we're at a point that we have so many tools. You know, where we are today versus where we were at the beginning of the pandemic. 
um, you know, we, we, we have the tools that we need and it's about consistently deploying them and deploying them to increase access around the world where they're needed most and what they're needed and how they're needed is different, right? It starts with, again, we continue to need to focus on prevention, right? And so prevention, the tools that we have around prevention are clearly vaccines. While we still see outbreaks, you know, they do uh, decrease significantly the chance of being infected. And of course, they uh, reduce the chance of severe disease. We also have other therapeutics that can be used um, preventatively, particularly for those that are um, most immunocompromised and most fragile. So again, those are carriers and we need to be able to bring uh, therapeutics and really focus on, on, on continue to focus on prevention. Um, then, you know, it's about making sure, and this is where testing comes in, it's about continuing to deploy resources, vaccines alone. We've seen that, you know, uh, Europe is a, an area that has higher vaccination rates than most of the world, yet we're still seeing it on fire, right? And so therefore we have to deploy these other resources, which is again about keeping our, our vigilance about testing, continuing to make sure that we're uh, screening population populations and understanding who needs to be quarantined and who needs to be treated. And as we're going to start to see these antivirals come out, it's about how do we operationalize so that we can do what we do in other programs, which is test and treat, right? So that we can keep these people out of the hospitals. Um, and, you know, once we get into the hospitals, we're now addressing really critical staff shortages, labor shortages, right? So we have to keep people out of the hospitals. But when we get in the hospitals, what are the uh, tools that we need to be able to make sure that we can get pe people treated quickly and hopefully get them out of the hospital with the ventilators and so on? Um, and uh, and so it, it is about um, how do we deploy these systems? If I, if I take what we do in other areas, it's about a network of um, the implementers and the funders and the providers of, of the tools such as Abbott and the tests that we bring, and really now at this point focusing and operationalizing. And that is where we see a gap. So for example, um, we've had, you, you've mentioned a number of times funding's there, right? We have dedicated capacity we've put for tests. There's been dedicated funding that is for tests in lower middle income countries. However, those aren't being accessed, right? Because it's people um, and, and systems and local communities don't understand or don't have the means to deploy them. And that's where we need to help. So I would focus on what is the most urgent challenge it's uh, bringing our community together and operationalizing and really determining where do we need to focus resources and they're needed depending on where the virus is and the life cycle of the virus in, in that community. Thanks, Andrew. I'm going to stay with you for just a moment. And um, we um, encourage our um, audience to bring in some more questions and comments. We have about a half an hour, but very quickly going to come back to um, you and, and, and each of the other panelists and then open it up. You so your, your, your message on what we need to prioritize is very clear. Do we, have the, do we have the partnerships and systems to deliver on this? This is a global challenge, both for this pandemic, but for prevention for future pandemics. It, mm -hmm. And if not, what, what do we need to change? What, what needs to change? What, what kind of, uh, you know, how does, how does the public and private sector need to work together differently? No, oh, thank you. Point. Right. And, you know, that that's where we are now is that we, we know public private partnerships work. Right. You know, we've been fighting infectious diseases for decades. If we start with the work that we've been uh, doing in HIV and malaria and tuberculosis that you mentioned. But if I if I talk about HIV as an example where we've been at this, it is about um, bringing the public and private sector together. And what do we do in HIV? It starts with a local government. It starts with the ministry understanding that they, you know, need to attack this and they're accessing funding resources by working with the NGOs and working with the funders. And it's working with the private industry to bring those tools into the marketplace. But so critical are the local implementers, the organizations on the ground that are actually connecting all the dots and helping uh, health systems in local countries understand, you know, what do we need to do uh, in your environment? How do you access those funding resources? How do you have local communities on the ground? How do you project manage them? How do you train the individuals that are going to execute? And then, of course, we've talked about how do we have metrics, accountability, and transparency to say, 
what are we trying to aim? Uh, what are we trying to achieve? And how are we measuring it? And how close are we getting to those goals? And, and you know, deploying more resources as needed. So again, it is that public-private partnership. It is organizations such as Abbott. When we work with our communities in HIV, we're out on the ground. We're getting our hands dirty. We're in the lab. You know, we're in the trenches. And that's what's needed. And, you know, many of these organizations have done it with other infectious diseases. And, and that's where we're at and, and what we need to do today with COVID. Thanks, Andrea. Gustin, you're one of those. You represent one of those community organizations that works on infectious diseases. But also this broad multilateral partnership of New York City 2030 across uh, sectors. So do you agree with Andrea? Is she like she defining the kind of what we need to do or what's, what's missing from her definition? What do you see in terms of the way um, we partner across sectors to solve these challenges? You know, we do have partnerships and we seem to be able to pull them together fairly quickly these days. For example, the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator Act, they came into existence very quickly after the onset of COVID-19. And it brings together multilaterals, member states, communities and civil society to some extent. On the UHC front, we have the UHC partnership, we have UHC 2030. We now have the Universal Health Preparedness Review, which Tedros mentioned as well as discussions around the pandemic treaty. And there are many others, including partnerships with a specific global health security focus, focus. I think the issue is how effective the partnerships we have are in genuinely bringing together all parties to the table as equals. And there, I think we have work to do. Often these global partnerships tend to be dominated by the people and the institutions who traditionally held power in global health, the global North over the global South, governments and multilaterals over civil society and communities. For example, on the civil society and, and community front, as you mentioned, I come from a community-based organization. We're often included in partnerships because parties recognize that it's the right thing to do, but not in a way which leads to meaningful input in terms of strategy or, 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 or direction. And that's a real challenge. There's been encouraging work in these areas. There's a recently launched WHO-led handbook on social participation to guide member states on the meaningful inclusion of civil society in the national planning processes. Perhaps we could put that in the chat too. There's a pending WHO civil society engagement strategy, including a new commission looking at WHO's own institutional engagement with civil society as two examples. But we have a very long way to go to turn intention into real substantive equitable inclusion is what I would say in response to that question. And while I have the floor, I might, if I may, respond to one of uh, the, the the excellent comments made by my good colleague Toshi from the government of, of Japan, who said, well, actually, we need to get vaccines into people's arms. Uh, and then we can talk about these broader issues. Uh, and I think this is really a critical issue we need to address. Yes, what, what you say, Toshi, makes complete sense. Right now, we have a critical crisis. Uh, and Ted Ross and WHO and everyone else has been saying we need to roll out vaccines as soon as possible and do it as equitably as possible. Completely agree. What I think is dangerous is the myopic fixation on the immediate crisis response at the expense of the longer term, because that is precisely what drives the cycles of panic and neglect, which have got us into the situation we're in now. So I think it's about a balanced approach between the immediate crisis and the long term future. And we really need to do both. Back to you, Carol. Thanks, Justin. Uh, actually, that is a great segue to a question I want to throw to Satoshi and to Beth, representing two powerful G7 governments, um, Japan and the US. Um, you know, if, if things are going to happen, it's going to be because the US and Japan, uh, among other uh, uh, powerful nations, decide that this is a prior political priority, right? Um, and so your leadership, the leadership of your governments, the investments of your governments are key drivers to determine what happens. Again, whether we end this pandemic swiftly, uh, but also whether we really take serious action to prevent future pandemics. So you've both talked about how this is a priority for your governments and we've seen that, but yet how does it rank relative to other priorities? And we don't see the same kind of levels of investment let's be honest, right, that we see towards other global challenges. We don't see the same kind of, of um, uh, you know, look at, look at how the world has rallied around climate, for example. You know, critical global challenge. Why aren't we seeing that same thing around pandemics? 
I mean, how how do you how do you build and sustain that? What are we not What are we not doing that we need to do to build and sustain that political will and support to do what's needed? Satoshi, let me start with you. Um, can I let Beth speak first as a larger donor <laughs> than our government? <laughs> As you wish, Beth, you're on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Satoshi-san, thanks very much. Um, we're, we are working really closely between the US and Japan on all of these issues. So I'll just take that opportunity to thank you for your partnership um, in the G7, the G20, and all of the other work that we're doing together. So um, I'll just say first, I think Justin, your segue was perfect. I think um, to use um, a, a phrase that we say frequently here in this White House, we need to walk and chew gum at the same time. We need to be able to do both of these things. It's easier said than done. I do want to recognize um, the obvious. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. The pandemic is not stopping. Vaccination rates are dangerously low around the world, and we need to improve them. And it's critical that we rally um, support to meet the targets that um, President Biden put out um, at the first global COVID summit in September. It's critically important that we focus on getting shots into arms. This was a huge focus for um, administrator, USAID administrator power um, this week during the ministerial that she hosted where we, we um, announced our global vax initiative. And really that's about also rallying donor support for vaccines and getting shots into arms. Um, so there are a lot of huge challenges, and I think we all realize that in this audience, that have leaders' attention. And so, Satoshi, your, your point was really well taken earlier. Leaders are very focused on the pandemic right now, and we need to we need to turn that into additional funding and support to make good on the commitments that we have to, to beat this pandemic. But I think that it is absolutely simultaneously critical, and this is really hard to do. I think all of us in government know how hard it is to keep leaders focused on an urgent yeah. crisis and the future at the same time. But we need to do that. This is at the top of our agenda. And the reason it's at the top of the agenda, you, you'll rarely, I don't think you'll ever hear our president talking about COVID without talking about, about health security and global health. We are really proud of being the world's leader in funding for global health. And we need to keep that emphasis and we need to keep the prioritization on this issue now because the political will window is closing and it will close without making investments um, to prevent the next crisis. So I think what I'll what I'll say is one sort of um, obvious statement that we need, you know, disease system, disease forecasting, outbreak analytics, testing, all of those things that we need to improve our capabilities for this pandemic are relevant for the next. And we should be talking about investments as helping with both things, including a stronger health system for everyone. Um, second, workforce, critical issue. I noted it coming up in the chat. Um, health workforce is vital um, for uh, beating this pandemic and being prepared for for anything else that comes our way. So we really need to see investments there. We need investments in our ability to, to produce medical countermeasures on a regional basis. Um, and that needs to be not just for these vaccines for COVID-19, but our ability to make vaccines on multiple platforms and to be able to pivot when variants strike that's going to help us with the next pandemic too. And we need to look at sustainable investments in vaccine production. Um, and then we, we really on governance, on leadership and on architecture for the future, I think we really need to bring together the conversation about the pandemic instrument, about IHR amendments, about establishment and financing in the establishment of a financial intermediary fund and the leaders level global health threats council. These topics have been discussed in separate silos and separate discussions. I think they're a package and the more that we can bring them together as a package, working together with our governments um, and with our coalitions, um, Satoshi, I think this is a good good place that we can have additional discussions um, with our partner countries. This is where we will be able, I think, to keep leaders' attention because right now we have some leaders focused on one, but not the package. Let's bring them together and figure out what the priorities are and let's push for them together around the world so that we can sustain attention. Over. Terrific point, Beth. I, I, I know many of us are frustrated that we feel like we're jumping from process to process, moment to moment, as opposed to actually dealing with this as the systemic challenge that it is. This pandemic is a systemic challenge. It's multilateral, it's multi-sector, it's whole society. Preventing pandemics is a systemic challenge. Okay, Satoshi, 
you're you're not off the hook now. You it's your, tell us uh, how how do we how do we make this the political priority and and get politicians to actually treat give give this the uh, not only the sustained attention but the sustained investment that it deserves. Yes. Well, first of all, I, I remember that in 2020 statistics actually Japan was the the the, the largest donor for COVID-19 uh, as of 2020. But as you said, you know the, the the challenge is how to sustain such level. And one, I'll just give you one example uh, of, of of that. Uh, also answering to the Justin's point uh, on vaccination and vaccines. So. We hosted, we chose to host a uh, uh, Vax, COVAX uh, AMC summit in June in, in collaboration with other uh, partners like, like the US and, and others. Uh, well, one reason was that to show our sort of solidarity to, to, to the world because our own vaccination rate at that point in June was only about 3%, I think. But the leaders decided to, to do that anyway. And uh, and also, uh, as as someone said, uh, you know, the we we wanted to combine you know different aspects of vaccine cooperation. So so we did uh, mobilize uh, financial resources uh, for, for for vaccinating forty percent of the the country by by the end of the the year, and and we we met the target. But also we wanted to also highlight other aspects of uh, what we call last one mile support. That our government is is undertaking, which is to basically support the, the actual delivery, you know, uh, uh, after uh, delivering to to the airports, uh, from the airport to to people. So, um, including cold chain, uh, uh, you know, delivery support and, and others. So, we also wanted to highlight that as well as those sharing aspect. So, so we uh, made a commitment and uh, on on those sharing aspect as well. So. We wanted to sort of uh, use the vaccine as an entry point for a bit broader uh, assistance. And so our challenge, at least from my point of view within the government, is how to uh, do the similar thing towards next year, because we, we, we do, not, do, do know that there will be another replenishment uh, of, of, for SEPI in March, and some, you know, sometime early next next year, I think there would be, there would be a, another COVAX replenishment. And in the latter half of next year, uh, thanks to the, the leadership of, of U.S. government, there will be a, another replenishment for the, for the global fund uh, hosted by the U.S. government. And so we, we are trying to figure out how to um, utilize those milestone replenish moments to make it. Uh, uh, as um, as broad as possible, uh, so we 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 will want to convince our leadership uh, uh, to finance those you know different uh, but very important initiatives, but to sort of try to make sense of all those different uh, replenishment, as Beth said, uh, as a package, and uh, one you know very uh, promising uh, you know. Uh, a, Approach is this, uh, you know, U U.S. government, uh, President Biden's, uh, you know, uh, initiative on those uh, summit. I, I understand that there will be another summit, which, which is a little bit intimidating uh, for <laughs> for uh, partner donors uh, for uh, you know additional funding. But that is a very, very, uh, very promising approach to to try to combine all all those different you know elements into one package. So we, we want to try to um, utilize those events to really uh, try to not only address immediate threat that is that's COVID nineteen, but also to address other long standing you know health issues inequality and you know health systems, uh, neglected tropical diseases and 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 all others. So that is the challenge we are facing, and uh, we welcome uh, fresh views. Thanks. Thanks, Satoshi. I'm really glad that you both really focused on that, the issue of how we look at all of this as a package, but also what you just talked about, about this multitude of replenishments, we need to do it all end, right? We need to, we need to make sure each of our, each of these global health institutions was built 
with a purpose in mind. And those we those 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 reasons for their being are ne never more important than now. Whether it's the Global Fund, whether it's Gavi, whether it's WHO, CEPI, they all need to be resourced and fit for purpose to do what they were set up to do. But that's not also going to get us to global health security, to a better prepared world. And it's not going to get us to certainly to ending this pandemic. So there has to be, we have to ha have the political will to do all of these things. And that's going to also require a mindset that isn't, this isn't as, isn't just about charity, as Tedra said, it isn't just about development assistance. It's also about treating this as a collective security challenge. And so again, we go back to that issue of security, but but if we don't look at it that way, in, I would argue, the way that we're beginning to look at the challenge of climate change, we still have a ways to go, then we'll never get there. So um, in our um, remaining minutes, I want to make sure we bring in some additional, uh, some of the questions from the audience. Um, Beth, sticking on the issue of financing, we have a question from uh, David Bryden uh, about the U.S.'s own budget priorities, a uh, billion dollar increase for global health. But... Um, the vast majority of that specifically for global health security programs. He's asking, is that the right proportion? Is that the right balance? Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, thanks, David, for the question. And, um, you know, what I'll, what I'll say is that we are really continuing to prioritize global health as well as global health security. And Satoshi mentioned our commitment to host the Global Fund Replenishment, um, as well as all of the, the global health programs that we continue to fund and request funding for. And I think there is absolutely recognition within the Biden administration that health security and global health are interrelated. So there is not a deprioritization of global health in this administration. I would say that there is a prioritization on increasing preparedness for epidemic and pandemic threats and filling many of the major gaps that we found um, here in the United States and around the world in our ability to deal with COVID-19. So um, I would say that it is an and situation. Um, and we also recognize that many of the investments that are going to be made in preparedness um, have a have a very um, strong and and um, and uh, tight linkage to how they are going to help everyday preparedness for health threats that are faced by every country around the world, including ours. So um, I think you want to dive into each of these investments within the budget proposal, um, and um, as always, welcome the opportunity to have more conversations with with groups about about these priorities and to hear um, from all of you about where you think we've got it right and and where you think um, we need to we need to pay more attention. Thanks. Thanks, Beth. And I, I would add, it's also, I think it was with a view towards making up for areas where there had been underinvestment in the past, right? So uh, clearly we need to do a lot more. Absolutely. And we're, um, as you know, pushing uh, pushing not only the U.S. government, but other governments to do much more. Um, Franco Cabala had a question, Justin. Uh, how do we ensure that no one, no country, no players left behind? How do we ensure that grace, grassroots organizations play a lead role in ensuring health security? and safety of communities in the face of pandemics. Let me throw that one to you. Uh, well, Franco, I think that's a really good question. And when you have the answer, please tell me because I don't I, <laughs> I don't know either. I mean, this is a huge challenge for those of us working working in communities. Um, I think the, the situation is that, I mean, there's been an increasing recognition. Uh, I, I may say that it, uh, sort of the, the HIV movement because that's where, where I come from sort of this is where it started 30 and 40 years ago of the role in, in uh, of civil society and communities and community-led responses. Uh, others may differ. Um, so there's been this increasing recognition over, over 30 or, or, or 40 years. But what we often see in countries is an ad hoc approach to the integration of grassroots organizations and communities. And uh, what that means is that when you have a crisis like COVID, you're kind of building things from scratch. And we did quite a lot of work at the time of the, the, the initial uh, COVID outbreak to look at uh, government's initial responses to COVID and the extent to which they included communities and, and civil society, and more or less they didn't with some notable exceptions. So my answer, and I mean, this is kind of a, a glib answer because I know that it's, it's, it's a challenge, is the institutionalization of social participation processes. There are some countries that do it quite well, Tunisia's social di dialogue on health, France has the État général de la santé, 
Uh, Iran has an excellent National Health Assembly. Uh, Thailand does as well. But most countries simply haven't institutionalized social participation. And when we do that uh, in a way that builds trust over time, we don't have to create these processes in a moment of panic. And I would suggest that that's a way forward. I'd encourage you to have a look at the handbook on social participation for UHC, which I think might be in the chat, but if it's not, it will be. Uh, there's a lot of work ahead is the, the, the one sentence answer. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Justin. Um, Paul Miller has a great question. I don't know who wants to take this up. Maybe, maybe you Satoshi, but um, on this issue of how the world is, you know, addressing climate change versus pandemics, but pointing to this issue of disinformation that we haven't brought up today, we know is, is all has been all too, um, uh, unfortunately, a huge challenge and growing challenge in the context of this crisis. Um, but we haven't talked about disinformation in the definition of global health security. And in fact, I would argue that we, um, we, uh, we knew that this was coming. It was something WHO had been warning about, right? Um, on uh, particularly on vaccines, but on health disinformation for before COVID. Um, so in many ways, a lot of governments around the world were caught flat-footed, um, unfortunately. So how do we how do we build this into um, our work? Or and Paul's uh, question: How should such disinformation be countered? How can these actors be held accountable? I would say. How do we make sure that this doesn't happen again, that we are actually tackling this threat as part of our efforts around global health security? Um, who wants to pick that up? Satoshi, maybe can I throw that to you? Sure, thank you. So, uh, so for example, vaccine hesitancy has been an, an issue bef even before COVID-19. But in the case of the Japanese domestic situation, we, we don't know, you know actually why, but the uh, the vaccination rate has really, you know, uh, really ramped up uh, to about 80%. We were really slow, uh, you know, initially, but uh, uh, as of October, I think it it, it exceeded, uh, you know, other other, you know, uh, most of the countries. And uh, so we, we do not know why, but the uh, the the one factor uh, that uh, might be uh, some some kind of like a fear uh and also uh, peer pressure uh you know uh of uh, not being vaccinated uh in in the community would be a bit uh you know there's a risk of being marginalized and uh so those you know social factor would have you know something to do with uh, this uh you know breakthrough uh uh, in in terms of vaccination attitude, but uh, we, we don't know whether that's generalized, uh, mm. that can be generalized or not. But uh, the, the the hesitancy issue is is in fact really uh, a challenge globally. Uh, so 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 we do not have you know like a magic bullet for that, but uh, it it is it is a very um, I mean uh, imminent challenge. So. I would like to hear uh, some uh, you know others on this. Uh, I think U.S. is also struggling on this, so or in Australia maybe. But uh. yeah, I'm I'm happy to weigh in on this too, Satoshi. I think you made a great point about the importance of communication um, in communities, to, which is hu hugely important to help build um, build public trust. And I think one of the things that we are learning in the United States is the importance of messengers in in all in multiple communities that can speak to and meet communities where they are on these issues i think that's also critical um, to overcoming the one of the key um, questions and i think um, outlined in paul's uh, initial question which is there's um, a tremendous amount of, of misinformation disinformation and hearsay um, out there about vaccine hesitancy but also more generally about about this pandemic and I think a, a couple of key things. One is the importance of having trusted messengers at the federal level um, who are trusted as scientific and public health communicators, and that's what they communicate about and basically all they communicate about. And that's something we've really prioritized with experts like Dr. Fauci, our CDC director, Dr. Walensky, our Surgeon General, Dr. Murphy, who when they speak, this is what they speak about and people are just used to regularly hearing them only talk about public health and science. I think that's so important. But I think in addition to that, 
We also really need community level public health communicators who are focused on mis and disinformation and able to counter it with facts very, very quickly. I think that's the most effective way at countering some of the, the powerful actors out there who are trying to undermine public health and science. Um, it's just to be prepared with facts. Um, I think it's also um, a broader conversation um, that I know that WHO and others are, are working to take on. And this is something that I think in our multilateral context, um, we need to be paying attention to, um, and we are. So, right, I would also just maybe yeah, add that, you know, on the testing front, we've been battling misinformation, right? And it's something I don't think we had expected, but very, very, very early on in the pandemic, understanding how to use tests, how to appropriately use, use, use tests, and very early on, there are there little pieces of data, right, that are showing that tests aren't effective where maybe in a uh, individual that, you know, is uh, positive on a PCR test 30 days past infection uh, didn't show up on an antigen test. And it shouldn't because they're not infectious anymore. But those pieces of information um, definitely complicate action. And when, mis, uh, and when there's a lot of misinformation, what happens is we get paralyzed, right? So again, uh, leveraging the, uh, the experts that Beth uh, referred to, to, to basically put context uh, into this, these different pieces of information and gain trust and credibility, what they need would be helpful on all aspects, vaccine hesitancy, but also testing and, and, and the other therapeutics that are gonna be coming to market. Thank you all so much. We're almost out of time. I'm gonna, just to close this out um, and to give us some hope because we have a new year and we need to be hopeful that things are gonna get better and that we're gonna solve these difficult challenges. Um, 30 seconds from each of you. What's the single most important thing we can do in 2022 to advance global health security? Uh, Beth, over to you. You had to say single. I'm going to say two things. I'm sorry. I'm setting the precedent early. So um, two things. One, we need to beat this pandemic and be serious about doing everything that is needed um, to end and beat this pandemic. And at the same time, we need to invest in health security and the architecture we need to keep our leaders engaged in it. We must do both at the same time. We must do it urgently. Um, and we must take action now. Over. Great. Justin, over to you. Uh, I may be in Sydney, but I'm going to take a little skip across the ocean and borrow from my, my Maori friends in New Zealand. Uh, I guess I would say this, but but they say, hey, ata te mui noa te ao. Uh, what is the most important thing in the world? He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It is the people, it is the people, it is the people. You can't have global health security without the people, without communities, without civil society. And you do that by building trust. Satoshi. OK, uh, just one word. Uh, we prioritize universal health coverage. Sorry, I'm, I'm like a broken record on this. But uh, well, we, we need to beat the pandemic, obviously. But at the same time, I, I would argue that uh, we, 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 really, we really want to be, become serious about uh, you know, achieving universal health coverage. And this is not next year, but uh, in 2023, there will be another UN high level meeting on UHC. So, and uh, by the way, in 2023, Japan will be hosting the G7. So we, we are already trying, you know, uh, starting to uh, plan, you know, how, you know, how, and we know what it will be. It will include USC for sure. But but uh, we, we we are interested in in how we can uh, achieve. Uh, I mean, arrive at that point uh, in 2023. And to do that, we need to beat beat you know COVID 19. Thanks. Thanks, Satoshi, Andrea. Well, just as Satoshi said, maybe I'm going to be a broken record as well, right? Which is, uh, you know, the uh, the community, global health community has put out goals, right? Goals of vaccinating 70% of the world in 22, uh, bringing a billion tests and, and bringing other resources to the world. So again, where I'm going to focus is we have to operationalize that. We have good plans. We have good tools. We have uh, great organizations. And now it's about having clarity and plans so we can bring those into action. Thank you all so much.